Project Red Light was formed, and experimentation and test flying alien craft was begun in earnest. As I told you earlier, many of the craft we recovered were intact, appeared to have no damage whatsoever. One craft actually exploded over the test site during testing sometime in the early 60s. I'm not sure what the exact date is, uh, but the explosion is said to have been seen over three states. Project Red Light, according to the information that I have, was postponed at that time because they had no idea what had happened or why the craft had exploded, but they lost the pilots, and the project went on hold. A super top secret facility was built at Groom Lake in Nevada in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Dreamland until this area was built. Testing was done at the Tonopah test range, and that's why some of you have conflicting information. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy and clearance of all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive, which means presidential or majestic approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. Many of you did not know that. The President of the United States cannot enter Area 51. There are very many other areas which he cannot enter also. The alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area known as S-4. Area S-4 was codenamed the Dark Side of the Moon. The Army was tasked to form a super secret organization to furnish security for all alien task projects. This organization became the National Reconnaissance Organization based at Fort Carson, Colorado. The specific teams trained to secure the projects were called Delta. A second project, codenamed Snowbird, was promulgated to explain away any sightings of the red light craft as being Air Force experiments. The Snowbird craft were manufactured using conventional technology and were flown for the press on several occasions. And those of you who are my age or older will remember as children or young adults going to the movie and seeing in the movie tone newsreel the Afro car and other strange looking saucer craft that were developed by the United States and the Canadian Armed Forces as a prod part of Project Snowbird. Project Snowbird was also used to debunk legitimate public sightings of alien craft, also called UFOs. Project Snowbird was very successful, and reports from the public declined steadily until recent years. But not just due to Project Snowbird. There was an intense ridicule, denial, and debunking campaign going on since the beginning. People stopped reporting what they saw. A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Millions of dollars were funneled through this office to MJ-12 and then out to the contractors and was used to build top secret alien bases as well as top secret dumb or deep underground military bases. I think dumb is very appropriate. And the facilities promulgated by Alternative 2 throughout the nation. President Johnson used this fund to build a movie theater and pave the road on his ranch, and I believe he also used it to fix his shower. He had no idea of his true purpose, but he felt that because it was military money, it was his money. The secret White House Underground Construction Fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. And you can forget Pruman because Eisenhower has done everything that's been done to us, not intentionally, not to hurt us, in the beginning to protect us. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attacks, called presidential emergency sites. The sites are literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country that I can account for, which were built using money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission has built at least an additional 22 underground sites, again, that I can account for. 
The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of the military office of the White House and was and is laundered through a circuitous web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow. As of 1980, only a few at the beginning and end of this web knew what the money was for. At the beginning were Representative George Mahon of Texas, the Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and of its Defense Subcommittee, and Representative Robert Sykes of Florida, Chairman of the House Appropriations Military Construction Subcommittee. Today, it was rumored that House Speaker Jim Wright controlled the money in Congress and that a power struggle was underway to remove him. We all know what happened there, but I could not substantiate by any source the fact that he was in charge of the money. It is a rumor. At the end of the line were the President, MJ-12, the Director of the Military Office, and a commander at the Washington Navy Shipyard. The money was authorized by the Appropriations Committee, who allocated it to the Department of Defense as a top secret item in the Army construction program. The Army, however, ladies and gentlemen, could not spend it, and in fact did not even know what it was for. Authorization to spend the money was in reality given to the Navy. You'll find out why the Navy has control of all this a little bit later. It'll become clear to you. The money was channeled to the Chesapeake Division of the Navy Engineers who did not know what it was for either. Not even the commanding officer who was an admiral knew what the fund was to be used for. Only one man, a Navy commander, who was assigned to the Chesapeake Division but in reality was responsible only to the military office of the White House, knew of the actual purpose, amount, and ultimate destination of the top secret fund. The total secrecy surrounding the fund that meant that almost every trace of it could be made to disappear by the very few people who controlled it. There has never been, and most probably never will, be an audit of this secret money. Large amounts of this money were transferred from the top secret fund to a location at Palm Beach, Florida that belongs to the Coast Guard called Peanut Island. The island is adjacent to property which was owned by Joseph Kennedy. The money was said to have been used for landscaping and general beautification. The money did not begin to be transferred to Peanut Island until shortly after Kennedy's assassination. Some time ago, a TV news special on the Kennedy assassination told of a Coast Guard officer transferring money in a briefcase to a Kennedy employee across this property line. It was on television. Could this have been a secret payment to the Kennedy family for the loss of their son, John F. Kennedy? I think it was but I can't prove it. The payments continued through the year 1967 and then stopped. The total amount transferred is unknown and the actual use of the money is unknown. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Nelson Rockefeller changed positions again. He had been in sort of a holding position until the time was right, and now the time was right. This time he was to take C.D. Jackson's old position, which had been called the Special Assistant for Psychological Strategy. With Nelson's appointment, the name was changed to the Special Assistant for Cold War Strategy. This position would evolve over the years into the same position Henry Kissinger was ultimately to hold under President Nixon. Officially, he was to give advice and assistance in the development of increased understanding and cooperation among all peoples. Sounds very nice and innocent, doesn't it? The official description, of course, was a smokescreen. For secretly, he was the presidential coordinator for the intelligence community. In his new post, Rockefeller reported directly and only to the president. He attended meetings of the cabinet, the Council on Foreign Economic Policy, and the National Security Council, which was the highest policy-making body in the government. Nelson Rockefeller was also given a second important job as the head of the secret unit called the Planning Coordination Group, which was formed under NSC 5412-1 in March of 1955. However, the memo was written in 1954 at the same time that NSC 10 and, or excuse me, NSC 5410 and NSC 5411 were written. It was not used until it was needed. 